right? Y'all can move over to 1 Thessalonians 1 if you want to while the choir is coming down. I preached from uh, this passage not long ago, and I just felt led to preach from it again. Uh, I entitled the message, the first time I preached from this passage, I, I entitled the message, It Was Good Enough for Paul, It's Good Enough for Me. And uh, with, with the con. Well, I was preaching from the perspective that uh, why are so many churches departing from the simple gospel of Jesus Christ being enough? I mean, it was, it was good for years. Let me, let me share this quote with you as you turn to the passage. Here's what the modern-day church assumes, okay? The needs and sensibilities of the unbeliever should determine the strategy of the church. In other words, let sinners tell you how to do church. That's number one. All the churches in history up until now were doing it wrong. Too old-fashioned, too boring, too stiff, too negative, too much doctrine, too ritualistic. People would be glad to go to church, but it's just too churchy. All we need to do is tone down all the religious stuff, make it fun and relevant, and people will show up. Address felt needs. Avoid telling people they're born sinners. A church should focus on meeting people's needs through life skills, success, psychological therapy, and leadership training. And it should help its members become purpose-driven people who can accomplish their destiny. A church doesn't need to preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins anymore, or if it does, it must radically alter the language to appease the believer. I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago. They're teaching some of our young men in our seminaries now how to state things without stating things. How to tell people they're sinners without telling them they're sinners. How to tell people that the blood atoning, uh, blood of Christ is the only way uh, to salvation. In other words, get the blood out of there. It's something we don't want to hear about. So, and, and, and some of our young men are being uh, taught that in our seminaries. How to, how to tell you the gospel without preaching the gospel. Numerical growth is, uh, growth is proof of God's blessings. Lack of numerical growth is proof that God is not involved. Well, in that case, the Mormons and the Muslims are doing quite well, aren't they? Some of our largest churches in, the Amer in, in our nation today have heretics standing in the pulpit that's preaching something contrary to the gospel. They're preaching another gospel and calling themselves Christians. In order to build the church, God needs vision-casting pastors. And these pastors must command their followers to do the work required by his vision that God uh, desires for them to, to what his vision, even if that vision is contrary to the scriptures. Uh, in other words, any vision a pastor has should line up with the scriptures, with God's word. Uh, so, you know, think about it. Let lost folks tell you how you ought to do church. Church needs to look to secular business examples to learn how to run the organization. I've heard for years that some churches in Kingsport run their churches like the Eastman rather than like what God tells us to do in this book. Uh, but anyway, dumb down the preaching. Oh, that's, that's extremely important. Uh, stay away from hell, fire, and brimstone. People don't want to hear that anymore. Uh, felt needs over solid growth decisions. John MacArthur said the notion that church meetings should be used to tantalize or attract is absolutely contrary to the word of God. So, Having given you that little illustration, I want you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And I'm going to read the first few verses, the first 
seven verses actually, of First Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. In God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Now, I want you to pay particular attention to these next three verses because this is the text that we're going to be preaching primarily from. For our gospel... For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we are among you for your sake. And you became followers of, uh, of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Father, we pray that you just bless the reading of your word this morning. We ask that we would glean from it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you will. As we look at this passage of scripture, the question would have to be asked, do we as Christians have confidence in the gospel? Do we have confidence in the gospel? Well, what I shared with you leading up with the uh, introduction, what I shared with you earlier tells us that many churches are looking for other avenues to put people in the pews rather than the old-fashioned, plain old teaching of the gospel, realizing the power of the gospel is enough. It's more than enough. So... From the very inception of the church, Paul looked to them with joy and gratitude as Christians. And he tells them they are worthy through the name of Christ to be believers. Now, the Bible refers to them as examples to all that looked on them. Now, in these verses, Paul speaks of the confidence that he had gained in sharing the good news. The good news is simply the gospel. Now, we're told that 80% of the people that will ever trust Christ as Lord and Savior, 80% of these people will, uh, will be people uh, that will be brought to Christ through the influence and through the witness of a friend. You ever think about that? Not, not in evangelistic meetings, not in church services, but through the witness of of a friend. Do you know that most people that come to a church, that attend a church, they come because they were invited by a friend. Now, let me stop there and just throw a little a sidebar in. If you don't invite people to this church, shame on you. That's part of your responsibility as being part of this body is to invite people to come into this church. Now, we see that that is a large percentage of people that attend church. Uh, eight out of ten people that will ever attend this church or any other churches that matter uh, that visit, they come through the simple invitation of a friend. So just as much as the church in Thessalonica was influenced in the first century, uh, we need to be an influence to our community, to our workplace, and to others around us. That's our responsibility as believers. You know, a lot of folks think that uh, you're, you're, they never witness to a friend, but they'll tell them, you need to come over to our church. No, you need to witness to them. You come here to learn and to grow as a believer. That's what, that's what you do when you come to a church. Uh, it, it is where the sheep are fed. By the shepherd, under shepherd, I should say. But actually through the shepherd, through the Holy Spirit. My responsibility is to help you grow as a believer. 
And as you grow as a believer, then your responsibility increases as far as witnessing and being an influence on your community and the world around you. So we see that our confidence is not in our program. Our confidence is not in lightweight, lifeway. Uh, our, our confidence is in the old time gospel that still is a powerful tool. Now, how we've come to the place where we think that the gospel has no power anymore to change lives, I don't know where we came to that place. Uh, we have more in this day and age that we live in, we, we have more uh, ways to reach the lost, we have more books, we have more educated preachers standing in pulpits, there are many of them being taught the wrong thing, but the fact of the matter is, all of these things does not seem to be bringing the power of the gospel to this nation that we live in. And God knows we desperately, desperately need that power. I mean, when you look at the situation in Washington, D.C. right now, and I know I pick on AOC, Ocasio Perez, but who wouldn't, you know? She was doing an interview just recently, and the interviewer asked her, what's your view of Roe versus Wade? She said, well, they got to get across the Rio Grande some way. <laughs> You'll get it. <laughs> It'll come to you eventually. But we, we, we kind of make fun of them, but, but it's ridiculous. And they're not the answer. Uh, the church is the answer. It's always been the answer, not politicians. Politicians are just that. They're politicians. They're liars. They're thieves. They, uh, they're lawyers. So, you know, you know how when a lawyer's lying, it's when his mouth is moving. I said that one time. We had a lawyer in our congregation. He never came back again. I hated it so bad. But Paul gained confidence through the gospel's empowerment. Now, we're going to focus in on, on verse 5 for just a little while. Look at this. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. And that comes from the word dunamis, which we get the word dynamite. So the power of the gospel is, is, is dynamite. I mean, it's powerful in every way. And in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Now, as we look at verse 5, we can glean a lot of things from verse 5 that just, just through some words that uh, show us certain things uh, that the gospel does to enable us, to enable us to have the power of God in our lives, but also have the power of God in our church life. So let's look at the Gospels and empowerment. Now let me give you these words very quickly before I address them. First off, now these are all in verse 5, by the way. Uh, we see the connection, uh, not in word only. And then we see the confirmation in power, in, in dunamis. See, Paul is telling them, this is, this is uh, where we have our confidence this is what God uses to change lives. This is what God uses to create powerful churches. These things are what we need to be focusing upon. And then the third th word we see is, is companion. Who is the companion that empowers us? Of course, it's the Holy Spirit of God. We don't need to be ashamed of the Holy Spirit in Baptist churches. We need to proclaim the Holy Spirit occasionally. We need to mention him a little more. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit is there to cause us to have the confidence that we should have in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then uh, we see the, uh, uh, the connection in verse 5. In much assurance... And then we see certain things that Paul addresses in this one verse that tells us that we should have confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the gospel's connection we see in verse 5. What is this connection that we have here? Our gospel did not come to you in word only. 
So the connection did not come in word only. There's a never-ending mystery in the preaching and the teaching of the gospel coinciding with the power of God to change lives. That's the power we talk about. Anybody that's ever been saved, ever been drawn by the Holy Spirit, quickened by the Holy Spirit, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Word is not what transformed you, but the Word of God is what complemented the Holy Spirit and enables us to rejoice in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, when I first started working with this message, I was thinking to myself, you know, people don't want to hear about the gospel anymore. Why, it's old hat, the gospel. Why, we live right here in Kingsport, Tennessee, where every kind of gospel in the world is taught and preached. But I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about the gospel that allows us power and allows us to be able to have confidence when we witness to somebody. It enables us to have confidence when we read our Bible that God is going to teach us correctly, that we're not going to be deceived by, by false prophets. We're not going to be deceived by cults. We're not going to be sending our money off to some heretic on television because the Holy Spirit will not let us do that. So we see that uh, the human word becomes a divine word <laughs> Through the truth of the gospel. Now you can't get that buying books or doing Bible studies or anything like that. You just got to realize that the simple gospel of Jesus Christ is enough. It's more than enough. Or perhaps it's better to ponder how the divine word becomes the human word. The gospel must come in words. It must be preached. It must be spoken. Though, and now, now, though actions may speak louder than words, there is no communication of the gospel until words have been spoken. For the gospel is a story. It's a story. The good news of Jesus himself. Listen, just stop and think about it. This was new to the church at this time, to people. People that were, were worshiping false gods. People that were running around and, 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 and praising idols and all of this stuff. And all of a sudden, you get the gospel. Hey, God came. God came to earth. God was born of a virgin. God was born in the place that the prophet said that he would be born in. And God in human form through Yeshua, through Jesus Christ, he walked upon this earth and was sinless in order to be able to pay the price and pay the penalty of our sin condition which we would not be able to erase or get rid of in any other way. And the good news is he died. The good news is he died on a cross. He shed his blood to pay the price for you and for me. And he paid that price that when you take your last breath, you'll be in the presence of a holy God because you couldn't do it yourself. Only Christ could do it. Only Christ could bring us before a holy God. Only he could eradicate and erase our sin condition by covering us with his precious blood and because because of that, we'll have life after life. If that's not good news, I don't know what is. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't ever let it get old. Don't ever get tired of it. Don't ever just get to a place where you don't sense the power. We don't need all the programs and the puppets and all the silliness that goes on in our churches today. We need to get back to the old time preaching of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And when we do that, I'm going to tell you right now, it'll turn lives around. But if the gospel becomes merely a matter of words, it degenerates into a travesty. And I'm afraid that's what happens oftentimes. We take it for granted. Paul calls it our gospel. Whose? Well, let's back up just a little bit. Verse 4. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Can y'all say that without grimacing? Say election. election. <laughs> y'all ain't afraid of election here, are you? Say predestination without grimacing. 
Let's say chosen without grimacing. Chosen. <laughs> Glory to God. How you can preach anything apart from realizing that you were chosen by God, you didn't choose him is beyond me. Because if it was left up to us to choose God, we would never choose him, as the old song says. And I don't know why people hate gospel, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ so much. But I don't know what took me here, but since I'm here, let's just go there, okay? There's, there's a little old hymnal here, and I've read this to our congregation many times, and I think it's worth reading because this is the condition of the church today in the land that we live in. In Baptist churches, let me, let me tell you something this morning. Baptist churches have a statement of faith that goes all the way back even before the 1689, but every one of them teach election, predestination, that your name was written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. God chose you. And you know why? None of us do. He chooses who he chooses. Oh, I don't believe that, preacher. I've got to step in here and protect God. Now, I believe every man has a choice. You do. Every person has the free will of their natural state. And in your natural state, you would never choose God. Right. When I was in the world and out running around and crazy as a loon bug, some people think I still am. <laughs> but when I, when, when I was out in the world, I want to tell you something right now. I could care less about the things of God. I was raised in church, and I thought it was a bunch of foolishness. I thought it was just a bunch of, the typical excuse, a bunch of hypocrites running around. I ain't going to get there with them hypocrites. I'm having fun with my hypocrites down at the bar. That's kind of the, the way that goes. I like to hang out with the hypocrites at Walmart on Sunday. You know, Walmart's full of hypocrites, but you still go there, don't you? And just a little sidebar there. But anyway, the fact of the matter is, why do you think you ever desire God in your natural state? Doesn't the Bible say there is none righteous, not even one? Doesn't the Bible say that no one can come to him unless the Father draws him? And that word draw means actually drags him. That's what conviction is, is when God starts saving you and pulling you in to the family of God. Even if you're kicking and screaming and saying, no, I'm not willing to give this world up, he'll drag you right in. That's what he did to me. Now, that's just my experience. Maybe your experience was different. Well, I was two years old in vacation Bible school, and I prayed the sinner's prayer with my teacher, and I'm counting on that to get me to heaven. But I haven't been back to church since. <laughs> See how silly that is? Listen to this. Why, why would you hate the fact that God loves you and chose you for the foundation of the world? Well, what if he doesn't save my children? Do we really have any say? We're to pray. Now listen to me. Don't misunderstand me. We're to pray fervently for the lost. We're to pray. We don't know what God's going to do. But we do know this. When God comes, he saves you. Amen. If you're one of his, he will bring you in. Would you rather God bring you in than make a personal choice in the flesh that's really not salvation, but deceives you for the rest of your life, thinking you're saved, and then death comes and you're cast into eternity away from God? I would rather know. So why do men hate? Why do men hate election? And that's the gospel, by the way. Listen, we cannot properly worship God unless we understand his sovereignty. Amen. You can't do it. How can you worship a God that you have control over? <laughs> have you ever thought about that? Well, God sends the weather. We can't do anything about it. God sends the rain. We can't do anything about it. Y'all need to make a decision for the Lord. God don't have anything to do with that. He doesn't. My God's in control of everything. 
I don't know how you could have any confidence in life unless God was in control of everything. But listen to this. This old hymn expresses it best. This is an old Baptist hymnal, by the way. It's not Presbyterian. Anyway, what makes mistaken men afraid of the sovereign grace to preach? Sovereign grace is election, by the way. The reason is, if truth be said, because they are so rich. Why so offensive in their eyes does God's election seem? Because they think themselves so wise that they have chosen him. Our perseverance, why so loath are some to speak or hear? Because as masters over sloth, they vow to persevere. Whence is imputed righteousness a point so little known? Because men think they all possess some righteousness of their own. Not so the needy, helpless soul prefers his humble prayer. He looks to him that works the whole and seeks his treasure there. His language is, let me, my God, on sovereign grace rely. And, and on tis free because bestowed on one so vile as I. Election. Tis a word divine. For Lord, I plainly see, had not thy choice prevented mine, I ne'er had chosen thee. And you won't. For perseverance strengthens. Strength I've none, but would on this depend that Jesus, having loved his own, will love them to the end. Empty and bare I come to thee for righteousness divine. Oh, may thy matchless merits be by imputation mine. Thus differ these, yet hoping each to make salvation sure. Now most men will approve the rich, but Christ has blessed the poor. So why would we hate the fact that God is in control of our salvation? Because we would have never looked to him had he not come to us first. It's that simple. Now that's the gospel. Now you see in verse 4 it says, Knowing, beloved brethren, your election of God. And then he goes in verse 5, which we're addressing. He says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. So, as we move through here, it says our gospel came. Paul puts the emphasis on uh, more upon the message as the means of realizing God's call than upon the bearers of the message. You know, we have a lot of preacher worship going on in America. Did you know that? I mean, I, I've heard people, you know, that same thing in, in Corinth. Paul had to address that. Oh, I'm, I, I was saved under Paul's ministry. Well, I was saved under this ministry. I was, well, I, I'm really a purist. I was saved under Jesus, uh, you know, and all of this stuff. Well, we've got the same thing today. It's human nature. Oh, I love John MacArthur, Virginia. Boy, boy, Charles Stanley's my favorite preacher. Wah, 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 wah. Hey, the message is the important thing, not the one that delivers it. Let me, let me give you a thought on that, if you don't mind. Do you believe when Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem? <laughs> And the people waved palm branches. Remember when that took place around, well, we, we celebrated it around Easter. They sang hosannas to the donkey, right? Hmm. And that donkey thought the applause was for him, I'm sure. He was just the bearer of the good news. That's all preachers are. We're the bearers of the good news. I heard somebody say one time, if the Lord could use a donkey to preach, he could use anybody. So the good news is the one we preach about. And then the gospel's confirmation in, in uh, verse 5, in power. I'm almost done. In power. In other words, in dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. It's speaking of something very powerful. And that's what the gospel, the true gospel of Jesus Christ is. Uh, it's, it's like physical dynamite, but it doesn't tear down. It builds up. It has the power to change lives. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. In other words, it's a powerful thing, and I ask you this morning, what has happened to the power of God? 
In the modern church, why don't we hear about men like D.L. Moody and Jonathan Edwards and Charles Spurgeon and R.A. Torrey? Why don't we hear about that anymore? Let, let me give you some examples. When, when I uh, first visited up at uh, Moody Bible, where I got most of my uh, early training, uh, when, when I was first went up, there was a plaque that was near the campus of Moody Bible Co or Institution, Moody Bible College now. But anyway, there was a, a plaque that said, this is, this is where D.L. Moody knelt and pleaded with God to allow him to build a school that would train powerful, godly preachers and missionaries, and it happened. Where is that power today? Why don't we see that power anymore? We need that power as never before. I think about Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was totally opposite than D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody, uh, he, he just absolutely destroyed the English language. He'd say fur and haint and things like that. But the power of God would fall on that man and, and he changed uh, America, or his preaching changed America and changed another continent in England. The power was upon him because God had given it to him because of his obedience and his faith. Where is it today? And then just the opposite, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was a very educated man. He would write out his sermons and read them. Some say he was quite boring. So how could the power of God be on that? Well, it was. They said that he was preaching his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I've read it, and I've thought about preaching it, but I know it wouldn't get the same results that Jonathan Edwards got. But sinners in the hands of an angry God. And men would get up and weep openly during the message and would grab hold of the of the pillars in the facility they were at or, or the poles in the tents where he preached and cry out, Oh God, don't let me slide off into hell. Oh God, save me. Where is that power today? That's what the power of the gospel will do. We need that power once again. And then Charles Spurgeon, this man, uh, would, would, would tell the, wouldn't you love to be able to do this? You folks need to go on home so we can let all these sinners in out here. Y'all come back to the evening service. Now churches are closing down the evening services rather than having a full house because they don't have room for the members on Sunday morning, for the lost people that's coming in to hear the power of the gospel. Where is that power at today? Let me ask you. Oh, we desperately need it. If America's going to change, if we're going to have revival in America, we desperately need the power of God. And then R.A. Torrey is told of him preaching a message, and he said, who would receive Christ? Not expecting anyone to do anything. One of the richest men in Chicago stood up and says, I will, sir. And then over here, someone else would get up and say, I will, sir. And a lady would get up and say, I will receive him, sir. And revival broke out. Why is that power? It's in the gospel if we realize it. Where is that power? 1 Corinthians 2, 4. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power. That's where that power is. Power refers to the clothing of the preacher's words with the vital force of God and the Holy Spirit. The word of God faithfully proclaimed is the most powerful force in the universe. It can change lives. It can, it can change lives. It can take the most base criminal, the most wicked, evil person, and make them soft-hearted and loving and turn their life around, and they become a new creature through the power of God. Where is it today? We desperately need it as never before.
The gospel's companion, of course, is also in verse 5, and that's the Holy Spirit. God comes in his spirit to empower the words used to proclaim the gospel. Acts 1 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witness unto me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth, to the ends of the earth. God's power is always, always associated with what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Confirm with divine power, with his power. The word was penetrating minds, hearts, Consciences and wills. I'm almost finished. Almost finished. And then we see the gospel's conviction in verse 5. In much assurance. In much assurance. With deep conviction is what that's saying. Paul's preaching was not only powerful in the effect, but he was confident in the presentation. He was confident they would not fall upon deaf ears that God would do with it as he pleased to do. And let me share that with you. When I was a younger in the ministry, it used to bother me when people would be on their devices in church service when I'm preaching or when people are jumping up and down, going back and forth to the bathroom and, uh, you know, they just can't hold their bladders while the preaching's going on. Amen. <laughs> anyway, it used to bother me. It doesn't bother me anymore. I've got confidence in the gospel, in the power of God. You know, and, and oftentimes when I've seen a move throughout the years that I've been ministering, when I've seen a move take place in a service that usually comes from the area where they're paying the least attention, how can that be? And I remember, Ron, you probably can relate to this. When I was a young preacher, I was kind of like the guy. I was kind of like the guy at the radio station, a thousand watt radio station, back when Jimmy Swagger was a big name, you know. And he's a friend of mine, Assembly of God guy. He said, uh, he said all these young Assembly of God preachers wanted to be Jimmy Swagger. And they'd get on these thousand watt radio stations, Eddie, and they would say, Now you listen to me, Mr. President of the United States. You listen to me, Mr. Supreme Court Justice. And he probably didn't have three people listening to him. That's kind of the way it is back when we were in church, when we were young preachers, you know, when you give the invitation. You give the invitation and, and nobody comes and you get a little bit aggravated, you get a little bit mad. And then you preach another sermon. <laughs> I may do that this morning. And then, and, then, and then you preach another sermon and then you, all right, now is anybody going to come? Is anybody going to come? Like old Joe Leonard used to say, they'd sing 527 verses of just as I am, the preacher would preach again, and then he'd beg again. A preacher told me one time, he said this, don't you have enough confidence in God that you don't have to beg all the time? He's a king, he's not a beggar. Hey man, hey man, he's a king, he's not a beggar. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if it falls on somebody, there would be nothing that will hinder them from receiving Christ as their Savior. Amen. So I quit begging a long time ago. I figured I'm going to have to have confidence in God. Because this preaching two sermons and having 500 verses of just as I am and all this other stuff that goes along with it just ain't getting it. It's just showing my lack of confidence in God, really. I was going to say, Ron, when I was a young preacher over in New Bethel, you had the same 10 people that came there every Sunday. And I'd beg and plead every Sunday for them to get saved. I'd have a half an hour altar call. Now you deacons, <laughs> now you people, now the Lord is, uh, the Lord's dealing with your heart. You, you need to come on up here and get saved this morning. There wouldn't be a lost person within, or a professing lost person within a thousand miles of that place. <laughs> so you got to have confidence in the power of God. The gospel goes past distractions. Let me say that. All right. And then the gospel convicts in much assurance. Isaiah 55, 11, 13 says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. 
For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth in the singing before you. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The power of the gospel. Acts 2.37 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut, cut in their hearts, cut in their hearts, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The spirit without the word is weaponless, but the word without the spirit is powerless. Warren Wearsby says. But this verse says they were cut in their hearts. Have you ever seen, been in the service and seen someone that might have been, had a reputation of being meaner than a junkyard dog, a reputation in the community? And an impossible case. God could never save that person, as self-righteous folks would say. He's, he's been too mean to get saved. I'm glad God didn't feel that way about me. What, what changes them? Cut. The Holy Spirit power cuts into their heart, circumcises their heart, gives them a new heart. That's what happens. Think about that. Changes lives. I've, I've, I've known people that's gotten saved, and old Doubt and Dan here, I always say, well, I don't think that's going to last. How many of you have ever made the mistake of somebody getting saved and lived a pretty rough life? I don't know if that's for real or not. It ain't none of your business. It's God's business. And if he penetrates their heart with the convicting power, the dunamis of the Holy Spirit, their lives will be changed forever. Amen. And I close with this. I heard a story, read a story not long ago about this, this preacher. He was a, a, a rough character. His testimony tells of how he was a drunkard, spent most of his time in a pool hall. His wife had left him, and he miraculously got saved. And then after a couple of years went by, he uh, was called to preach and started preaching the gospel and has become very successful. And he tells of his friends, his lost friends, and there was one in particular that God had laid on his heart. God had told him, you need to go and you need to witness to him and buy him to be saved. And he said, oh man, I can't do that, God. He's a big man. So he was about 6'8", worked out all the time, could fight a buffalo and win, and had a horrible temper. And on his way down, he was praying, God, oh, Lord, don't, don't let him kill me, Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what, what I really feel you're telling me to do, so don't let him kill me. So he comes and he knocks, and he calls the guy and says, can I come down for a while? And he said, why, sure. Do. So he goes down, and he comes in, and he said, I was sent here by the Holy Spirit, I know to invite you to receive Christ as your Savior. Do you feel that you need a Savior? He said, you just don't know how much. And he said, they knelt, he wept, he cried. And the preacher said, man, I was thinking the good Lord, he didn't kill me. <laughs> but he said he was like a child. And he said, I was back at that church a few years ago the church that he started at 10, he said he's still very involved, very dedicated, and a part of that work. Hallelujah. Amen. God can take that knife and he can plunge it and cause repentance. Circumcise your hearts, the prophet said. Change your life. Let me ask you this this morning. Has your life been changed by the power of the gospel? Can you assuredly say, I know Christ. He's mine. 
I can stand and testify to the day that he stuck that knife into my heart and saved me. If not, I would invite you to come to Christ today. Let us stand at this time.